Welcome to another edition of Emerald Hill Skies. We're happy to have you tonight as we come back and revisit the Caldwell objects. We've been working our way through this list of 110 deep space objects. It's just a little bit more advanced than the Messier list, which is kind of the gold standard of starting out in, in astronomy, amateur astronomy. Uh, after those 110 objects, this would be probably the next most logical place to go. And uh, it takes pretty much an entire year to work through the list because some objects are not visible until you get to a certain season. So it's been a while since we've uh, visited the Caldwell list. I think this might be our eighth video in that series. So we're happy to have you back. Let's get started here. I think um, in the sky we've got some good clear skies tonight. Perhaps you can see just a, an airplane over there on the horizon uh, just uh, skating past those trees in the sky glow of Louisville, Kentucky. We're located on the outskirts of Louisville and the telescope we're using is a Roe Ackerman Schmidt astrograph. It's there on a PeerTech adjustable height pier in a PeerTech uh, Telestation 2 uh, roll-off roof observatory. You can see the live view of the scope there on the left um, over there and then down here you can see the live view of the sky through our uh, ZWOSI ASI 178 monochrome camera. Uh, immediately over here you can see a view of the observatory, the interior of the observatory with some red lighting there. So we're happy to welcome you. I hope you'll jump in with us. Let's go to our um, planetarium software. We use Starry Night Pro Plus and uh, we've got our list going. Let's connect our telescope here. Uh, let's see, we're going to show telescope control and click on connect and um, hope that it connects up there. Sometimes it takes a while when I've forgotten to do this. Let's try that again. I don't know why it takes a while sometimes to, to go ahead and connect up when I um, let some time pass, but sure enough, there we go. Now I think it's uh, grabbed hold and we'll see the, the telescope now. Yeah, it's tracking the night sky and connected to Starry Night Pro so that we can use Starry Night Pro Plus as a pointing software. Well, it actually um, dropped out, didn't it? Let's try that again. We'll bring up Starry Night Pro Plus. It's just part of uh, getting all this stuff to work. Quite a bit of um, uh, juggling that we do with all these different layers of software. This is uh, the software that we use with um, being able to look at the night sky and and see what's up, so to speak. Um, let's go ahead and open up. We'll get rid of this little. Let's go ahead and open up. Um, let's go to our lists here and pick up the Caldwell working list. While that's picking up, we'll go ahead and do an altitude sort on that list. And then we'll go over here and now see if we can go to telescope control and try that one more time. See if that'll connect to the telescope. Still being a little bit stubborn. Up oh, there it goes. We uh, operate about 200 feet away from the scope. We're actually inside of my office here at Emerald Hills. And uh, so we're about 200 feet away. We use uh, uh, fiber optic cable, buried fiber optic cable, fiber optic cable between here and the observatory. And all of our data and control software travels across that fiber optic cable and uh, it's kind of a fun operating setup. All right, so let's get started here. You can see that we've got several objects here in the working list that we still need to observe. So let's just open up an info panel for Caldwell 33, otherwise known as NGC 6992. It's the Eastern Veil Nebula. You can see we have several observations we've made of this nebula before. Let's center on that in our planetarium software and that'll show us where in the night sky we're going to be viewing. So you can see down here the east compass point and directly uh, up over the east compass point you can see the part of the sky where we'll be viewing. So that kind of gives you an idea. This is the meridian so that would be straight up. So um, why don't we uh, 
change our title down here. This is Caldwell 33, and we'll just put in C33, otherwise known as NGC 6995. And in the same view, we have NGC 6992, <clears throat> a, um, a diffuse nebula in, uh, and let's see, that would be in, um, in Cygnus, C-Y-G-N-U-S, in Cygnus. Okay, and then we'll uh, come back up again, and I think we're ready to go there now. So let's click here and slew to C-33. While we're going there, we'll let you follow the movement of the scope. And uh, then in the um, planetarium software, you can see the way the telescope crosshairs travel across. And then in the sky view, you can see the movement of the sky as it uh, tracks with the telescope slewing across to that view. So that's the part of the sky we're looking at. You can see with the view of the camera, it's uh, kind of looking over the rifle sights of the telescope when the telescope is looking straight north toward the pole star, Polaris. So you can tell if the telescope is aiming up to the right, that would be aiming toward the east. And the weights, see the waist of the scope, the weights of the scope that are down, and the telescope's pointing up there about, uh, what, uh, 63 degrees high up in the sky. So uh, let's come back over to our screen now, and let's click into our actual, uh, we'll put in C33 into the, into our sharp cap and let's do a, a plate solve and what that'll do is it'll help us line up the view of the sky with what uh, the telescope expected uh, that it should be seeing. While that's happening I'm going to go over here in my um, yeah I can see we're live we're going to check this audio yeah and uh, I can also see that Susan is with us. Susan welcome uh, glad you're here. Tell us where you're logging on from, if you don't mind. Uh, if you have a moment, just tell us where you're located. Uh, this is kind of an impromptu session, so we didn't really expect anybody to be here with us, but you guys have seen that we're on, and you jumped on, about a half dozen folks, and that's fun that you're there. So if you don't mind, you guys that are listening in real time on the live stream, kind of uh, log on and tell us where you're listening from. Okay, so we had a 1.67 degree correction. Now we should be looking directly at the place where uh, C33, the eastern veil, will be located. Now you notice it's a very faint object, so when we're looking up at the night sky, you can't really see anything. So what we do is we go up here to the sequencer and we begin uh, doing a form of imaging that we, uh, typically it's called stacking. What that means is we're gonna take 20 second time exposures. So the fact that you're not really seeing any image right now is a sign of the fact that we're still collecting that first image. And down here in the lower right, if you can see this little orange bar, it shows you as each exposure is collected, and then it uh, flashes it up there on the screen. So that's the first 20-second time exposure. If you're interested in this sort of thing, we're operating at 100 gain with our ASI 2600 MC Pro uh, astro specific camera. It's just uh, made specifically for astronomy and it's mounted on the end of that uh, RASA. Uh, there's the RASA telescope in that observatory. Let me see if I can find a better picture of that. Yeah, there you go. There's the ASI 2600 on the end of the RASA and that's the business end where that uh, corrector plate glass is. If we were using an eyepiece, then this is where the eyepiece would be located. Of course, uh, that wouldn't make much sense, would it? Because uh, if we had an eyepiece there, then that would mean that you'd have to uh, put your head out in front of the corrector plate to so be blocking the light. And so the way a Roe Ackerman Schmidt astrograph works is that it actually uh, doesn't have an eyepiece. The camera takes the place of the eyepiece and collects the light for us. Now the payoff for you who are joining us tonight is 
that we are all in this together. You're seeing this at the very time, the very same time I am, and we're kind of observing together as a, as a team here. So let's go back to our screen and let's do some tuning here. The first thing we'll do is we'll do a color balance on the light and then let's move our um, blacks right over here to the right of this crest and that'll establish a new definition for our picture of what is going to be our black level. And I don't know if you can see, there's already just a very small hint of the Eastern Veil. And now when we move our mids up, you'll start picking up the Eastern Veil in the scene. You can start seeing it there. We don't want to get so much that we pick up some of that halo of light, but we want to get enough to where you start seeing those filaments of red there. And we'll zoom in just a little bit so you can kind of focus on the veil together with us. We want to kind of fill up that frame. And the Eastern Veil Nebula is extremely faint. Uh, it would normally be, if you were doing this as an astrophotograph, we might photograph the Eastern Veil Nebula for six hours. But um, in our uh, form of astronomy that we use here at Emerald Hill Skies, we uh, we use EAA, Electronically Assisted Astronomy. So we're actually observing this real time. We're taking 20 second time exposures and stacking them on top of one another. And as we stack, it averages out the light and the blacks get blacker. In this case, those hydrogen uh, puffs of light, the, where the hydrogen was scattered out through space and these stars are illuminating the hydrogen, kind of backlighting it, ionizing it. You can see the Eastern Veil Nebula being uh, described here on the uh, Caldwell uh, book that Steve, J Stephen James O'Meara has written. You can see it here, uh, up here at the top, it'll show you Caldwell 33, and of course it's got Caldwell 34 on the same page. And uh, we'll read what Stephen James O'Meara wrote about this. He said, now that's about Caldwell 34, Let's see if he has a specific section on 33. No, he kind of batches these together. He says, uh, about, about 15,000 years ago, an unknown star died spectacularly, spectacularly in Cygnus. The event, a type 2 supernova explosion, would have briefly dominated the night sky on Earth. If prehistoric peoples were in the habit of gazing toward the heavens for meaning, they might have found it in the sudden appearance of this new star, which could have rivaled the full moon in brilliance and remained visible for weeks in broad daylight. The creator of the oldest known human art, and he attributes that to the Cro-Magnon, uh, might have witnessed this stellar apparition and conceivably they recorded the event in a cave painting somewhere, though if they did, the artwork remains undiscovered. What has been discovered, Stephen James O'Meara writes, is the remnant of that powerful blast popularly known as the Veil Nebula, uh, NGC 6960, NGC 6992, and also NGC 6995 together constitute the corpse of a single supergiant star that perished in a supernova explosion. More than 100 such corpses are known, doubtless many others await discovery. Also known collectively as the Cygnus Loop, the entire wreath-like complex is an illusion of sorts. Its various pieces are parts of an expanding shell of dimly glowing gas measuring six moon diameters in our sky or 80 light years in space. It appears loop-like in part because we see more gas in a given square arc minute of sky when we look at the shell's edges than when we gaze through its middle. A photograph of the veil seems to tell a simple yet haunting tale, one that has been echoed over and over again since time and moral that life, even for things cosmological, ends in death. That's his uh, brief description there of C33, Caldwell 33, which is the NGC, 60, NGC 6992 and NGC 6995 portion. And that's the part that we've zoomed in on here right now tonight. And you're starting to see the reds strengthen a little bit. It's a beautiful view, if you ask me. This was discovered by William Herschel in 1784, and uh, we get to witness it here tonight, real time. We're going to pump up our mids just a little bit more. Look at that. Isn't 
that amazing that just in six minutes time, through the magic of electronically assisted astronomy, we can make this out. Now, look at the way here. Uh, we see a lots of, almost look like greenish blues here, and that would be your oxygens that are illuminated there. And here are all these reds. Those would be your hydrogen uh, gases. These are your oxygen gases here. Let's back off a little bit. And uh, nope, that's about all we're going to see tonight of the of the Eastern Veil. We'd have to move a little bit to see the Western Veil. That's a beautiful picture. You know, I'm going to capture this as a screenshot right now. I'm going to start way up here, just barely visible there. This entire section, along with those two bright stars, this is um, C33. So we'll just save it here with the name. We're going to put it in um, desktop and put it in the folder sharp cap captures and we'll call it C33 and then maybe we'll put um, <clears throat> seven minutes and then we'll put uh, something like uh, 22 frames and then the date 20, 2022-22 08-16. That's just a beautiful shot. All those subtle oxygen atoms being backlit there. Oxygen gas and hydrogen gas. <clears throat> Don't forget to let us know. We have about 10 on the live stream now. Don't forget to let us know if you would where you're observing from, if you don't mind. Just use the comment there, the chat, and uh, let us know. We're glad to have you along with us. Then we'll also save this as seen. It's a sharp cap, um, a sharp cap feature that we can save this. Sharp cap is the imaging program we're using tonight, and that allows you to stack real time in the RAM of the laptop. It's a fascinating piece of software. It allows you to adjust these uh, color bars here, uh, the histogram at the bottom. I think with uh, the other images we have to see, uh, that's probably as far as we'll go tonight. But boy, I would love, and I, I'm sure that some of you all would as well, I would love to just spend the entire evening focused on this one thing, the uh, Eastern Veil, Caldwell 33. Let's do an observing, an observation here real quick before we go. Um, we're going to add a log entry and we're going to... Ah, oh, we haven't done a new observing list tonight. We, we should do that first. So before we... Let's go ahead and delete this and um, go back up here to observe and go to sessions. And I think our session will be um, Caldwell, Caldwell Catalog. I think we're calling that series... Oh, just Caldwell Part 8. That's what we're calling it. So this would be um, observing session 79. So we're going to say 0079, and then we'll say Caldwell part 8. And for our timing, we'll um, make it through... I don't know, let's say 2 a.m. on the 17th. And we'll just put here in the comments, back on Caldwell list. And uh, that'll be the session that we log on to right here when we do our new log entry now. We'll associate it with um, the Caldwell list and we'll and it's already picked up the observing session here, as you can see. We'll add the telescope with our Rasa 11 with the 2600, and we'll say, wow, the um, Eastern Veil was clear as a bell tonight. We could even make out the oxygen, the O2 um, gases, along with the hydrogen. Hydrogen. Okay, you can see I observed this last in April and then 
last year in July and a couple of times in June. This is a popular object because it's so beautiful. Let's uh, zero in just for a second and see what this looks like in our planetarium software. You know, it is pretty, but I almost liked our live view better. And over here is the Western Veil, you can see as well. Okay, uh, let's go to our Caldwell working list again. And let's find, I, I don't know about you, but I feel just a little bit closer to C33. Um, Susan, you're in Arizona, glad to have you aboard. Uh, you know, this would be a very, a very boring uh, chat queue if it weren't for you, Susan. So you've got your grandsons. I don't know what age they are, but welcome to your grandsons. If you get a chance, tell us what age they are. And if you're listening in, uh, uh, boys, we're happy to have you along. I don't know what, what age you might be. Let's uh, go back to C33 here. We'll sort by altitude. And uh, let's right-click on that and say Add to Observing List. And what we do now is we add this to Caldwell Observed. Oh, it's already there. We'd already observed this, hadn't we? And uh, now let's get rid of it from the Caldwell Working List. And the way we do that is we go up here to Live Sky. And not sure why it left C33 in there. We're going to go to Live Sky, which is the kind of the companion site to Starry Night Pro and also uh, Sky Safari, the um, uh, companion software on um, iOS, you know, for iPhones and iPads. And we'll search for C33 here, C33, and we'll We'll edit and search for C33 and we'll delete C33 now from our working list. So you see our workload, we made sure it was added to our observed list and now we're deleting it from our working list. So that way we'll know that it's been observed and next time uh, we won't uh, maybe focus on it as much. There's a little lag between when it disappears from our software here. Let's go on to C42. Uh, so now we'll, uh, let's see, let's show the info. This is a globular cluster. And let's uh, center on it. And C42, let's also slew to it. So we'll let you watch the scope as it moves to go find C42. And you can see it adjusted just a little bit. Uh, let's see, Daniel Mimo, you're in Brazil, wow. Um, you're studying to pass an astronomy class at the university. Wow, well, we don't want to distract you, Daniel. We want you to pass that class. I wish I could be taking the class with you in your university. That would be awesome. Uh, we did observe this back in September of 2021. Let's uh, head on over to our uh, live view of the sky and do another... Uh, plate solve. So that way, again, we're entering another correction in the model of the mount uh, observation model that we're using tonight. Every time we put in a correction, it'll make our scope a little bit more accurate. Uh, when it views these stars, it compares the star patterns to what it expects to see. And if it's not right on track, it'll align it. And it was 0.1 degree off. And you might recall the first time we were like 1.6 degree off. So with that correction now, we've become a lot more accurate in our pointing. Now what it's going to do is it's going to change the um, direction of the telescope by one-tenth of a degree so that we're a lot more uh, carefully aligned. Uh, let's see, are we at, yeah, we're at three seconds. So let's start our imaging now. And um, notice the first glance there. Oops, I better put you back on the screen. We'll start our imaging. And again, these are 20-second time exposures. Um, Susan's wishing Daniel good luck. Uh, Susan's grandsons, looks like one of them is 20, and the youngest is 16. Wow, good to have you guys aboard. You guys are in high school and also uh, graduated. Um, you know, uh, Bartholomew, we, we support everybody. We, we, we love everybody, so for sure. Um, Daniel th tells us thanks 
for uh, uh, wishing him good luck on that astronomy class. If you get a chance, Daniel, just one last distraction, tell us the title of your astronomy class. Is it like an intro or is it a more of an astrophysics class? Uh, we're doing, of course, here tonight more of an observational astronomy, so it'd be much more basic. Uh, Bartholomew, we're glad uh, to have you aboard. All right, so uh, here we are. Uh, let's go back out to full, full view of our frame and back these mids off just a little bit. Let's do another color balance just to make sure that we are indeed color balanced, and we are. Let's bring just, I'm going to hold the shift key down and move that bar just a little over to the left. That'll increase our sky glow a little bit. Ah, I can see our uh, object now. I don't know if you've seen it, but let's zoom way in because it's right here in the middle. It was so tiny, I almost hadn't noticed it at first, but look at that tiny globular cluster. Now that is 100% of our camera's frame. You can see the, 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 the Rasa 11 is kind of famous for having a very wide field and of course wide is uh, relatively speaking wide. It's about what? About a degree and a half if I remember. This little tiny speck of a globular cluster is much smaller than the overall frame that we have. Once again, let's uh, zoom back out to our full frame. Now that's the full frame. It almost looks like just a fuzzy star in the middle. But look, if we zoom in, now you can start to see at 100% it's actually a globular cluster. Now let's zoom in at say 200% and it won't get any clearer but you might be able to see a little more of the structure. And then let's go in, although it's going to get fuzzier and fuzzier, mosaic-y and more and more pixelated, but now you can see a little more of the structure as we zoom in. So let's get rid of some of that pixelation and put it right about there for our purposes. And Really, uh, as we look at this globular cluster, uh, we're looking back in time. Let's see if, let's see if in our, uh, by the way, we need to change all of our titles, don't we? This is Caldwell 42, so let's change this, um, and it'll ask us, do you want to rename the picture when we save a copy of the picture? It'll, it'll ask us that in a minute, I think. And then let's go down here to our title and say, and rename this C42, a globular, globular cluster. And let's see what constellation this is in. It's in the constellation of Delphinus, the dolphin. Delphinus, D-E-L-P-H-I-N-U-S, Delphinus, the dolphin. And we'll go back out to the screen before I forget. Now let's look up in our Caldwell, um, guidebook here and look under Caldwell 42. Sure enough, uh, Stephen James O'Meara has this photo of Caldwell 42. You can see it looks pretty much like the one that we're putting together here, except our photo is not as quite as zoomed in. He says, globular, globular clusters, scintillating bouquets of hundreds of thousands of suns, adorn the most distant reaches of our Milky Way. While bright stars and open clusters populate our galaxy's flattened disk, most globular clusters lurk in the galaxy's spherical halo, a cold and bleak domain of old suns and mystery matter that spans a quarter million light years of space. Caldwell 42, that is NGC 7006 in Delphinus, is exceptional even among globulars. It lies on the halo's very fringe, 135,000 light years from the Earth. Let's go ahead and go down to the title here and put in here um, 135,000 light years from the sun. And we'll go back to the screen before I forget. Sometimes I forget to put us back on the screen. Um, <clears throat> it may be a part of the galaxy's outer halo or corona. From our station on Earth, NGC 7006 or Caldwell 42 lies nearly twice as far as the most distant Messier globular, M54, though it is twice as close as the most distant Caldwell globular, which is Caldwell 25, NGC 2419, the famous intergalactic wanderer in Lynx. Uh, 
Caldwell 706 lies 127,000 light years from the center of our galaxy. Of the 150 or so globular clusters known within our Milky Way, NGC 7006 is one of the most remote. As of 1997, it was considered the eighth most far-flung globular from both the Earth and the galactic center. So, an incredibly uh, interesting uh, globular cluster here. We'll go ahead and save a... Um, <clears throat> So you want to save a scene and uh, switch back our sequencer to the more of a live view to go to our next target because uh, we need to move on. We have lots of other sites to visit. We'll do a quick little observation here of uh, Caldwell 42. We'll say, um, notice it kept all of our Caldwell lists in our observing session. We'll say we could clearly make out this tightly packed glob 135,000 light years away. Okay, so now we'll go up here at Caldwell 42 and we'll make sure that is in Caldwell Observed. And it isn't, so we'll add it there. And now we need to erase Caldwell 42 from the working list here so we're still in edit mode. So we'll go Caldwell 42. And there it is. We'll delete it. And with it deleted now, we'll save that list. And then head back. So you can kind of get an idea of our workflow. Let's go to Caldwell 47 now. Slew to Caldwell 47. Center on Caldwell 47. Open up an info blank for Caldwell 47. This is another globular cluster, so we'll change our title down here, Caldwell 47, and this globular cluster we've never observed before. It's in the constellation, also in Delphinus, so that all stays the same. We'll uh, <clears throat> erase this distance from our title. Put it back on the screen. Let's go back now to our... Um, there, you can already see it. This is Caldwell 47. And let's go back out to our full auto view and do one last plate solve. And this probably could, could be our last plate solve if we wanted. Uh, let's see. Catalina, Catalana, Catalana Oneg. Uh, we're happy to have you here, Catalana. Where are you observing? From where are you logged on from? Your name sounds like uh, maybe Eastern European. I don't know. Olivia, good to have you. You're very kind to encourage. Uh, there, you're saying amazing. Thank you, very kind, Olivia. You're you're an encourager. We have about 15 on the live stream. Feel free, you guys, to to uh, let us know where you're observing from. We're happy to have you aboard. Otherwise, it would be a pretty lonely place here tonight. We did this observing session kind of. Um, um, impromptu. By the way, we were only seven hundredths of a degree off, so I think our our model has been corrected now just in our third uh, plate solve. So we really don't have to do plate solves from now on. Let's start our imaging run. And again, when we do this, we switch from doing three second uh, fast exposures at something like 300 gain. We drop our gain to 100 because that's a sweet spot on this camera, the ASI 2600MC Pro. It's, it gives us our widest dynamic range when we're photographing at 100. And then we also, um, we do a, we do our exposures at 20 seconds. And that gives us a little more detail, some of the more subtle stars. I don't know that we really need to do another uh, that did help us some, to do another um, color balance. Our blacks look okay, and really for this object, our mids look okay as well. It's not like we're trying to pull in uh, something very subtle and faint. This is a fairly bright object. Let's go in and, and go in at 100%. Again, it's, it's bright, but it's small, isn't it? It's very, very tiny, but look how it's kind of a green snowball there in the middle, huh? And uh, I don't know how many, we could drop our greens a little bit. Maybe that would make it a little bit less green. Looks like the greens are 
a little high, to be honest. Now we've got some oranges here. And this is Caldwell 47. Let's see what uh, Stephen James O'Meara wrote about Caldwell 47. Catalana's waiting for darkness where she is. Philip is there in Colorado. Ah, Catal Catalana's in Northern California. Uh, Olivia's in Ohio. Welcome. Glad to have you here, Olivia. Philip is there in Colorado. Um, glad to have you aboard. And Mike is watching from Georgia. Good to have you aboard. Mike, I think you've been here before. Good to have you back. Caldwell 47. Stephen James O'Meara wrote, uh, Globular clusters are the Milky Way's senior citizens. Does it look like a senior citizen to you there? Uh, <clears throat> When our galaxy was adolescent some 10 to 16 billion years ago, thousands of globulars are thought to have formed from its original allotment of gas. The clusters may even have begun life as cores of dwarf galaxies. That looks like a core of a dwarf galaxy, doesn't it? In time, though, most of these primordial clusters perished in repeated tragic encounters with each other or with the galactic center. Today, only about 150 globulars the remnants of the largest dwarf galaxies are known to have survived these ravaging encounters. Delphinius, the small but illustrious celestial dolphin, harbors two of these. And we already looked at Caldwell 42, now we're looking at Caldwell 47. These Caldwell clusters are separated by about 11 degrees, roughly the width of a fist held at arm's length. Uh, NGC 6934, it's another name for... Um, Caldwell 47, is about as far south as Epsilon Delphini, the dolphin's tail, as NGC 7006 is east of Ga Gamma Delphini, the dolphin's nose. They're about the same spectrally. I want you to see the um, sketch that uh, Stephen James O'Meara did of this galaxy, Take a, uh, this globular. Take a look at that sketch, and he shows that it's about three minutes wide, three minutes. Now let's go back to the live view and let's go ahead and zoom in a little more beyond the optical zoom and let's look at the digital zoom. And so maybe you can compare it to Stephen James O'Meara's sketch in your mind. Look how you've got this brighter core and we can make out some of the stars of the brighter core. Let's go ahead and pull in our our observing list here, and let's say, I mean our observing panel, let's say, we could make out, you know, sometimes this observing panel does this, it, um, it's not so happy. We could make out uh, several brighter stars in the core. Let's go ahead and get our, yeah, our uh, imaging software as well as several stragglers, we'll call them several apparent stragglers, um, traveling with the bright core. So this globular cluster, it's like, these stars are like traveling through the night together. Isn't it a beautiful sight? First time we've ever observed this Caldwell 47 otherwise known as NGC 6934. So we'll save an image of this exactly as seen, and we'll also, um, that's probably good enough. Uh, wow, I think I need to watch Star Trek, Lisa says. Lisa, it's good to have you aboard. Glad you're back. You know, Lisa, we had said the other night that we would come back on Wednesday, but I saw that it was a clear night tonight, and I hated to waste the sky. So we we fired things back up tonight in an impromptu way, and here you are, you joined us. Good to have you back, Lisa. So let's go back to uh, our next target. Uh, <clears throat> boy, that's a real-time snapshot. That's amazing, isn't it? Now we're in our three-second time exposures again. And let's make our way. Yes, Lisa from Indiana. Let's make our way. Oh, we have to do our little... Um, song and dance here, don't we? C47, add that to the Caldwell observed list, and then go over here to C47 and delete it from the working list. Delete. 
and then save. Uh, you can see we have C30, Caldwell 30 here. So let's slew there. Let's center on it. Let's open up the info pane on it. C30 is a spiral galaxy. And it is in um, Pegasus. C30. So let's go back to our um, shark cap before we forget. And let's change the title here to C30. I suppose we might as well do another plate solve. It doesn't take that long. And that way we'll just check our mount one more time to make sure that we're um, carefully aligned. Tommy, good to have you back here. Yes, we're on. We kind of went impromptu because the sky cleared out and was so beautiful. Philip, you're very kind to encourage. You say, love this program. Susan, thank you for acting as kind of a, a host hostess here. We appreciate that. Susan's saying, welcome, everyone. She's got her two grandsons, or several grandsons, 20 and 16. Um, Tommy, good to have you on. I forget where you're observing from, Tommy. Is it, is it up north, Minnesota-ish? I forget where you're on at 0.28 degrees. So I'm kind of glad we did another... Um, when you message you through Facebook on the night, night of the meteor shower. Yes. Glad to have your board again, Tommy. I remember you now. C30. Let's go down here and change our title. This is C30, a spiral galaxy in Pegasus, the winged horse. And uh, before I forget, let's go back to the screen. And I guess now we're ready to be able to start imaging. You know, when you start out and you just look at that first slide, you wonder, what are we going to see in that picture? Wichita. Good to have you aboard from Wichita, Tommy. I mean, you look at that first picture and you think, there is nothing in this picture. Uh, but sure enough, a 20-second time exposure brings out a little bit of it. And then when you start stacking those 20-second time exposures, one on top of the next, it begins to bring out more. And here we are, in 20 seconds, you can already see the beginnings of that spiral galaxy, can't you? Look at it there. Now that's our 100% view. Now the interesting thing about Arasa is that it, it is considered a very fast telescope. And you guys that have done uh, 35 millimeter photography are familiar with this term, fast. It doesn't mean that it uh, races across the night. Uh, that telescope sits there on that uh, pier, they call it, that adjustable height pier, pedestal, it sits there all night long. So it's not like it's racing, but uh, what we mean when we say fast is that the focal ratio of this telescope has a very uh, low numeric number, which means it has a very wide, so to speak, uh, aperture. And uh, the, the, the focal ratio, so to speak, of this telescope is f2.2. And if you're familiar with 35mm uh, photography, uh, you might buy a lens that's uh, f11, or maybe a little bit faster, it might be f8 or f5.6. If it's a, a, you know, a wide angle zoom, who knows, a wide angle uh, lens, it might be, uh, you know, 3.5 or something. Well, this telescope has a focal ratio of f2.2. What that means is it's got a very wide open mouth to the light. It's kind of a light bucket. And being 11 inches wide, it just adds to the amount of light it can collect. The, the mirror in the back of this Rasa telescope, if you can see the back of the scope there, that mirror in the back is 11 inches wide. And that collects quite a bit of light compared to other scopes that might be eight inches or six inches or four inches or even smaller, this is a very wide, relatively speaking, a very wide uh, telescope for amateur 
astronomy. So that enables us to collect light fairly quickly. Let's uh, dial up our mids a little bit more and let's zoom in a little more on this object. This is a faint galaxy as well. I mean, it's bright in its core there, but look at those dust lanes just starting to show up. You can see that bright core though, can't you? This is just with two minutes of exposure and you can already see some of those dust lanes. Let's see what uh, Stephen James O'Meara wrote about Caldwell 30. He says, when the lavender curtain of dusk falls toward the western horizon in mid-December, the mythical winged horse Pegasus vaults high across the meridian. Many observers find this an opportune time to hunt down the great globular cluster M15 within sniffing distance of Enif, the star marking the horse's nose, or the Andromeda galaxy, M31, which immediately follows the horse across the sky. But about four and a half degrees north-northwest of Eta Pegasi, beneath the flying horse's front legs, lies another magnificent, though often overlooked, spiral galaxy, NGC 7331, or Caldwell 30. From dark skies, this galaxy can be glimpsed this galaxy can be glimpsed as a dim slash of light in 7x35 binoculars. Challenge yourself and your friends to hunt it down this way at your next star party. It, uh, he goes on to talk about there are several galaxies in Pegasus and that it has a modest apparent sky, a size, and it belies its true enormity. In fact, NGC 7331 is among the largest galaxies known. If we accept a distance of 47 million light years, and that's been verified by the Hubble Space Telescope, it has a linear diameter of 130,000 light years. So that would be 30% larger than the Milky Way. And it appears to have a total mass of 300 billion suns. So let's jot these down in our title down here so we can sort of remember that. We're talking about... Um, 47 million light years away, 135, 130,000 light years, we're running out of space, uh, across. And um, 300 billion suns. Boy, I wish I could just write down all that stuff. That's extremely interesting that this is one of the largest galaxies known. Now, in our view here, you can see that uh, we're barely picking up at uh, five minutes. We're barely picking up some of the dust trails there. Um, Susan says four grandsons. Tommy, James Webb Telescope is great for mankind. That's for sure, Tommy. Uh, Tommy Acknowledges 11 inches pretty big. Yeah, Tommy says I wish we could go to galaxies to see what is waiting for us That would be cool wouldn't it to just travel there Philip says have to leave look forward to next time. Thanks for joining us for a while Philip 300 billion suns great Scott. He says uh, you sound like that guy in uh, Back to the future, you know the uh, professor 60,000 gigawatts or whatever the guy's name was Ted uh, Fusca says wow that is fascinating it is Indeed. I tell you what let's do. Let's go over to um, the Hubble catalog and look at C30 the way Hubble would see it. And um, it's pretty much the same as we're looking at it through our 11 inch. Not. <laughs> I'm just joking. The Hubble view is so much more detailed, isn't it? I mean, it's a different um, universe <laughs> to see all those, all those suns out here in these dust trails and then to see all the detail of the core just beautiful isn't it it says the majestic spiral galaxy caldwell 30 also cataloged as ngc 7331 is often touted as an analog to our own milky way as its size shape and mass are similar to our galaxies caldwell 30 starry disk is inclined to our line of sight so long telescope exposures often result in images that evoke a strong sense of depth in this Hubble close-up, taken in visible and ultraviolet light using the wide-field camera 3, the galaxy's magnificent spiral arms feature dark, 
obscuring dust lanes, bright bluish clusters of massive young stars, and the telltale reddish glow of active star-forming regions. The bright yellowish central regions harbor populations of older, cooler stars. As in the Milky Way, a supermassive black hole, SMB supermassive black hole, lies at the core of this near-twin galaxy. Wow. And uh, this, this photograph happened to be taken while the Hubble was studying a supernova. And who knows but what maybe this is the supernova right here, here over here to the left. Uh, it's supernova SN 2014C. It could very well be right there that we're looking at. It says 45 million light years away. It's about a half degree from a group of galaxies known as Stefan's Quintet. All the 30 in the quintet may appear to be near each other in the sky, but the quintet is actually six times farther away from Earth. Discovered 1784 by William Herschel. Also, he also discovered the planet Uranus as well as many other Caldwell objects. Well, it's just beautiful, isn't it? While we're here, let's go to Live Sky and find it. Um, C30. And we'll delete that from the working list. Save it. Let's go over here to the um, let's add it to the observing list observed and make our observing entry here. Wow. 45 to 47 million light years away. That's amazing. You know, I just want to. Um, Call attention to that fact for a second. Imagine something 47 or 45, whichever it is, we'll call it 45. Imagine something that's 45 million light years away. There's the planetarium software's uh, astrophoto of it. Very beautiful, very beautiful disk. Let's go back to the live view one more time. Um, the live view right here. And um, we'll capture that as seen. Just want to kind of think about this for a second. Think about the fact that this object, about 130,000 light years across, this galaxy, has been emanating light in the form of these little photons. You know how photons are. They're they behave sort of like particles, but they also behave sort of like waves. And so from this galaxy, these photons have been spreading out in all directions for the last apparent 45 million years. Think about that. This light has the apparent age of having traveled 45 million years to get here. Now, throughout that entire journey of 45 million years, these little photons, little tiny packets of light, behaving sort of like objects, but also behaving kind of like waves, these photons were traveling and they didn't bump into anything. They didn't bump into any planets. They didn't bump into any stars. They made a beeline straight for our telescope. But on this night, August 16th, 2022, several photons, many, many of the photons that had been emitted from this object, C30, Caldwell 30, collided with the mirror in the back of our Ross 11. When they hit that mirror, they were redirected up into the camera sensor. And that, ladies and gentlemen, was the end of their 45 million year journey. Now I kind of almost feel guilty because nobody else in the universe, even if there are other observers on other planets, and I don't know if there are, but if there are, whether they're humans or little green men or whatever, if there are other people with telescopes on other planets and other parts of the universe, they will never again see the photons that we captured in our 11 inch mirror and redirected up to our little camera because they are gone now. 
we captured them and they landed splat on our sensor and they stopped their journey. And I almost feel guilty because think about it. They were having such a good time. Woohoo! Traveling through the universe. Woohoo! And then they splatted against our mirror and redirected up against our camera. And now they're dead. Their journey is over. We've harvested them in a little uh, light bucket, little, little sensors at the end of our camera sensor, and now they're dead. Now, isn't that a tragedy in a way? On the other hand, they have a legacy because now we've turned them into a YouTube video, and before they were just little packets waving through space, but now you've seen them. So their journey wasn't, uh, you know, in vain, was it? You've celebrated the life of this galaxy. It's kind of a fun story, isn't it? I don't know. What do you think about all that? Um, let's see. Uh, Tommy says, Doc, uh, there's research that's coming out referring to not a, every galaxy has a black hole at the center, right? Can you look at any planets in the solar system tonight? We could. Uh, well, there are some. Um, let's see. It's crazy to think about that. Amazing, Susan says. Jeff, it's so good to see you again from Montana. Welcome. We are doing well, and we hope you're doing well as also. You've probably worked all day long in the surgical suite, and now you've come back and jumped on YouTube and were kind enough to join us, Jeff. So thank you for jumping on board. Tell me there are other entities out there. So you're pretty convinced that there are other entities out there. So I'm going to go with your theory, Tommy, that there are. Anyway, this is the end of our observation of uh, Caldwell 30. I kind of feel bad leaving it because now we're going to just like stop. And yet we, we trash those photons so they can't be seen by anybody else. What do you think of that? That's so sad. Oh, Jeff, you're on call. Ha <laughs> ha. Okay. Well, we're glad you were willing to stop in. Let's, uh, let's visit... Oh, did we already do this with Caldwell 30? Did we already put it in the... Um... We did. We already added it to the observer. Let's go to Caldwell 57 now. We're going to slew to Caldwell 57, and while we do that, we'll let you watch Caldwell 57. Let's uh, center on it. Let's bring up the info panel for it. And you can see the telescope. Wow, this is a bending over backwards. That looks like we're really close to the meridian. So we have to be fast on this. This is another spiral galaxy. Oh my goodness, we are close to the meridian. But wait, we are already west of the meridian. So we're good, right? Or are we? No, we're not. We're, we're leaning back over past the meridian. So we, we ought to be really fast on this. This is an irregular galaxy, it's called. And it's in the constellation hmm. what constellation is it in oh Sagittarius Sagittarius has two T's Sagittarius Sagittarius there's no O U S in the end it's just U S so let's uh, let's go down to our title and let's uh, call this Caldwell 57, and it's NGC 6882, 6822, and it's an irregular galaxy in Sagittarius. Did I say it had two R's? Is that what we said? I want to make sure we spell this correctly. Sagittarius. No. Two T's. Let's go back here and take one of these R's out and put in two T's. And uh, let's go back to the screen before I forget that. And now let's go back up here to Sharp Cap and put in C57. Let's drop back to the full view, do a quick plate solve. And this is our first time to observe C57. Um, Kimberly, good to have you. 
Thanks for logging on from Florida. We have about 16 now on the, on the um, live stream, which is amazing that because we did this completely, completely uh, impromptu. It just was a clear night, so we said, let's do this. Um, Vito from PureTech, welcome. So glad you're here. Vito, you probably had a long day making observatories just like this one. You've been building these all day long, designing and building them, and we're enjoying them. So thanks for designing and building the observatory we're using. We're about a third of a degree off, so we've corrected that. So now let's go to our sequencer. Make sure it's settled in there for a second. Yeah. Now let's start our imaging run. Boy, notice how there's just nothing visible there. And then we start doing these time exposures, and it's fascinating that these 20-second time exposures would pick something up. Let's uh, see what Stephen James O'Meara wrote about Caldwell 57. Uh, he said, wow, you wrote quite a bit about it. Uh, NGC 6822, otherwise known as Caldwell 57 in Sagittarius, is arguably the most celebrated and important deep sky discovery ever made by Edward Emerson Barnard one of history's great visual astronomers. How about that? And we're going to try to see it right now. Barnard swept up this large and elusive glow in 1884 with the five-inch burn refractor at Vanderbilt University Observatory. Do you think Vanderbilt University Observatory is at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee? At the time, Barnard had no idea of the nebula's extragalactic nature. Sadly, he would pass away in 1923 just one year before Edwin Hubble would use the famous 100-inch reflector atop Mount Wilson to identify several seafood variables in it. When Hubble worked out the distances to these stars, he realized that NGC 6822, like the Andromeda Nebula, and he puts nebula in quotation marks because it wasn't a nebula, it was another galaxy, is not part of our Milky Way, but a self-contained stellar system far beyond. Barnard's galaxy, NGC 6822, would soon become known, uh, had emerged from the stellar foreground of the Milky Way to stand out boldly as an independent galaxy, a small but important member of our local group. Wow, so this object that we're going to try to observe here, it was the object that contained the seafood variables, which gave um, Edwin Hubble, using that 100-inch ref reflector atop Mount Wilson, are we sure that's a reflector? Uh, the ability to find those seafood variables, it gave him the ability to make this known that it was a galaxy itself outside of the Milky Way. And this was the first time this had been known. Now, I'm not seeing it yet. Are you? We are not, are we? Now, what we have to keep in mind is that I wonder if the moon has risen yet. Let's open up clear outside. We are not using a guide camera, Vito. Just pure 20-second exposures with our Ioptron um, CEM70 um, mount. Yes, the moon is up. The moon rose at um, around 11 ish Oh, here it is. 11.23, sorry. The moon rose at 11.23, and it's 11.45. So we are getting some moonlight, and it's significant. The moon is at, uh, this is, is this Tuesday night? Sorry, yeah, it's 68%. So we are getting some moon glow, and that's taking away, it adds to the background noise that moon does, sadly. Hmm.
seeing a little bit of strange rotation. I wonder if that's because we hadn't let the mount settle enough. You think? Look at that strange rotation there. Hmm. Let's stop the live stacking and restart it. What's that? Oh, you know what? It's because our our mount backed up against the meridian. Remember I told you this was going to happen. So let's go back to our scope view. Look at our mount. See, it's leaning back over too far. So why don't we slew to this object again, C57, and see if this time the mount corrects itself. Yes. See how the mount now is going to go over and put its weights down on the west side. And uh, the telescope itself is going to be over on the east side. So what we were getting there is the telescope was now uh, backing over. Imagine it's like been, it's been looking backward at the meridian, and it is allowed to go around 10 degrees past the meridian, and then it just stops. And I don't think this mount has an automatic feature to, um, to cause it to re, uh, you know, to do this meridian flip like this. I think. You know, it basically just says, why did you do this to me? This is hurting my back. And then it just stops. So what we had to do is manually meridian flip. And uh, that's just what happens when you're looking at an object that's right on the meridian like this. So now we're back again. And uh, things have settled down a bit. Let's do a new plate solve. And the reason why I would recommend doing a new plate solve is we just moved 180 degrees across the, across the mount. You know, the weights shifted to the entire other side of the sky. So now in this, in this new view, um, we're about uh, 1.17 degrees off because we, we, um, we traveled the entire night sky. So you see the shifting of the stars there. And what the mount is doing now is realigning itself to the view of the stars. And as soon as it settles down, we'll start live stacking again. Did you notice that in our live stack picture, we were starting to see some, some funny star trails, weren't we? Now let's start our imaging run again. Um, So we've got about 21 on the live stream now. Feel free, if you haven't done so yet, just to tell us where you're logged on from tonight. Sometimes it's interesting. We've had people on from Brazil and California. Um, okay, so now we're actually back in our imaging run again. Good. Let's do a new um, color balance just because now the moon is going to be working against us all night long as it rises higher and higher in the sky and kind of bleeds into our background. Um, yeah, Vito is in Illinois, up near Chicago. Mike is asking if we ever see Starlink. Yes, we do. We are satellite bombed quite often because our uh, RASA has a one and a half degree wide angle view when it comes to telescopes, a pretty wide view of the sky. We see a lot of telescopes. Simon, welcome from Perth, Western Australia. So glad you're with us, Simon. Um, so it's uh, what? Must be about noon for you, noonish. You're probably just getting ready for lunch there. So glad to have you back on board. <clears throat> okay, so we're back here with uh, Stephen James O'Meara. The photographs Hubble took with the 100-inch resolved NG6822 to its core, allowing him to identify numerous variable stars, clusters, and nebulae. Ironically, Hubble's visual impression of the object through the same telescope was much different. Hubble wrote that 
NG6822 is fairly conspicuous at low power in a 4-inch finder scope, but barely discernible at the primary focus of the 100-inch. So, Stephen James O'Meara says, a bigger aperture isn't necessarily always better. Indeed, observations of the object made with other large telescopes led to the same confusions, to some confusion. And uh, he begins comparing different journal articles. Um, this is a, a very long article about the, um, the object C55. You know, I'm going to let you see his uh, sketch because the sketch shows you just how faint this object is in the night sky. It's about five arc minutes wide, but his sketch is very faint that he drew through his telescope. He challenged himself to try to find this, and he had to relax his gaze through his 7 by 35 binoculars, and he thought he could pick it out against the Milky Way as a faint ghost, a uniform splotch of dim light. He saw it as magnitude roughly 8, nearly a full magnitude brighter than the accepted value listed elsewhere. Hmm. Fascinating. Caldwell 57. So let's do our log entry here. This is my first time to view this. Fascinating. Uh, this is again a little bit of a hassle that Starry Night Pro has this glitch. But fascinating that this irregular galaxy was the key to discovering the fact that we were looking at objects outside our own Milky Way. Amazing. This is C57, isn't it? So let's go here and add that to the observed, Caldwell Observed. Let's go up here in Live Sky and um, find it and remove it from Caldwell Working List and save. So if we had a long photo, you know, astrophoto exposure, it would look like this. But let's see what it looks like in our um, boy, are we going to be able to pick it out? Let's back off a little more. You can see the halo of our rasa. It's kind of odd, isn't it? Should be there in the middle. Oh, there it is, yeah. So we had to make the night sky a little bit brighter. Now let's zero in. So it's right here. Yes, now we can start to see it. Tell you what, let's pump up the mids a little more. Yeah. <laughs> We're actually seeing quite a bit of it. It's because we have these stacking frames. We now have five minutes of stacked exposures. But as much as anything else, it's also because this is an F2 scope. The fact that we can see it relatively quickly. Now I'm really boosting the mids up high. And so we're seeing quite a bit of the, the background uh, illumination from the moon and from the light pollution in Louisville. We run a... Um, a light pollution filter on our RASA. It's the, the Celestron light pollution filter made for the RASA. And it does eliminate a lot, like six distinct uh, man-made forms of light. But it can't eliminate every form of light pollution, nor can it eliminate the moon light. So that's kind of it's destroying a little bit of our ability to distinguish between what is this galaxy and what is the background illumination of the moon and the light pollution. But I hope you can see right here in the middle, look at this, 
look at this general background. That's a little bit of a splotch of light. So it's a little bit, a little bit brighter than the background illumination around it. I mean, compare this background. I wonder for a minute, let me just make this a little bit darker. I'm going to hold the shift key down. I'm going to move this dark level over to the right. Boy, you can't, you can't move it over too much because then you lose the perception of that blotch. So I'm going to put it back right there, I think. Now let's crank up the mids a little more. Now look how we're starting to pick out this nebulosity right here and this nebulosity right here. Now we're at 125% of our camera sensor. So we're now into the digital zoom. Let's go back to the 100% view. Again, this is a little bit of blotchiness there. You know, I have these lights that are made. Um, I'm going to dim them a little more. And um, that way I hope I can see a little better because honestly, they're kind of competing. They're kind of competing with my ability to see. You know, that is a lot better for me. These lights that I have for the sake of the live stream were kind of competing. Can you make it out through the the YouTube. Uh, Ted, good to have you on from Philadelphia. Nearly midday for Simon. Yeah, Tommy was reminding us to switch cameras and then he gave us a high five. <laughs> Thanks. Boy, you kind of have to know it's there, don't you? you? You can see why it was discovered. I mean, you, you kind of have to be looking, but these little blotches here show up a little better Tell you what, let's do. Let's go over and look at the Hubble view of Caldwell. What are we looking at here? Caldwell 57. Let's go back here. And let's find Caldwell 57 here. Oh my goodness, look at the Hubble view. Okay, we probably shouldn't even look at this because it just spoils our. More than two million light years away, still within our corner of the cosmos, lies the irregular dwarf galaxy of Caldwell 57. Also cataloged as NGC 6822, this galaxy was discovered in 1884 by American astronomer E. E. Barnard and is often called Barnard's Galaxy. Astronomer Edwin Hubble used the 100-inch telescope at California's Mount Wilson Observatory to make the first detailed photographic investigation of Caldwell 57 in 1925. Now look at this. This is one of those blotches that we're seeing. Compare this blotch. Memorize what that looks like. See how that's kind of got a, a flame and then a bright core here? Now let's go back to ours and let's look for that. Right here, I bet it is. Maybe? Who knows? Yeah, I bet it's this right here. Now we're looking at it from a different vantage point. This is sort of upside down from our vantage point. But look how there are two stars right here, and the Hubble resolves them as unique stars that are just a, they look like a double star here. Now look here at that double star reversed. And then here's that bright star here. And this bright splotch at the bottom. It's upside down from our vantage point of our rasa. So this little blotch is this study of a stellar nursery within Caldwell 57 called Hubble 5. This image combines observations taken with a wide field and planetary camera to invisible and ultraviolet light. It's beautiful, isn't it? Look at how that's resolving thousands and thousands and thousands of points of light. And it's all within this giant field of splotchiness, Barnard's Galaxy. 
You can see how there's a little bar here, and then it sort of spreads out here. Let's take a look at um, the photo that Stephen James O'Meara used. Again, this is Caldwell 57. Let's remember that. Here's the photo that Stephen James O'Meara included. Look how it's just a bar and then some blotchiness. See that bar? Now let's look back at our live view. Boy, we've got a ways to go, but here is a possible bar, just barely visible. Here's another possible bar, but no matter what, it's showing up a lot of extra stars. We're at 12 minutes now. Let's go ahead and save this as seen, and that's that's all we'll do. I'm going to capture a screen capture of this just because this is such a small object. But this is fascinating that this became, this was the discovery that allowed humankind for the first time to be able to know that there were other galaxies. Until this moment, this is C57 at uh, 13 minutes with 39 frames on 2022 August 16th. Actually, it just turned into the 17th, didn't it? So we'll put the 17th. I'm kind of fascinated by this. The fact that we're looking at the very thing that allowed us to know that we have other galaxies. Susan, thanks for joining us. Uh, you're going to go feed your animals. Thank you for being a part of this night tonight with us. You, you were a big part of this, welcoming everybody. Thanks for your hospitality. Hope you'll stop back again. So we're going to end our relationship right now with uh, Caldwell 57, but let's don't forget this. Barnard's Galaxy. Barnard's Galaxy. Let's now go to Caldwell 55. Caldwell 55. And uh, this is a... This is the Saturn Nebula. This is a planetary nebula. Let's go down to the title. Actually, the scope is still moving, so that's still pretty fascinating to be able to watch the scope move. Again, it's about 200 feet away out there in the observatory. And um, look how we're back on the east side, and we're going to have that same phenomenon again, aren't we? It's eventually going to back up against the meridian. So let's hurry up and observe it before we before we back up against. <laughs> okay, so there you see it. It's kind of just barely on the east side of the meridian, which is the halfway point. Now let's go back to our screen and let's uh, back off here to do our plate solve. And this is C55. So we'll say C55, a planetary nebula in constellation Aquarius. This is the planetary nebula in the constellation of Aquarius. Okay, so I shouldn't give up my day job, should I? In Aquarius, the Saturn Nebula, as it's nicknamed.
And um, let's go back to screen before I forget it. And let's go back up here and make sure we put in C55 and sharp cap. And now we can start stacking. Let's take our lids down while that stacks. Um, C55. This is a fascinating object, isn't it? Let's see what Stephen James O'Meara says about it. On the evening of August 29th, 1780, Pierre Merchain, Charles Messier's contemporary and rival comet hunter, discovered a faint glow in Aquarius. Four degrees southwest of 4.5 magnitude, new Aquarius. Messier searched for Machine's find the following October on the evenings of October 4th and 5th and determined its position relative to New Aquarii. Now known to be a globular cluster, this object became the 72nd. Are we on the right object? Yeah. The 72nd in Messier's glowing list of non comets. So, what, he mean, what Stephen James O'Meara means is. They thought it was a globular cluster at the time. On those same two evenings, Messier discovered a cluster of three or four faint stars which at first glance resembles a nebula. Again, Messier determined the, object's, the new object's position relative to the new Aquarii, and this tiny asterism became the 73rd object to enter his catalog. The irony of these discoveries and their follow-up observations is that about one and one-fourth degree due west of new Aquarii is one of the heaven's brightest planetary nebulae. NGC 7009, otherwise known as the Venus Nebula and the Saturn Nebula <laughs> and the ghost of Saturn Nebula. And it's entirely, it entirely escaped both Messier's gaze and Machine's. But this is not surprising. Although NGC 7009 is bright, it is also small. Its brightest part spans only 23 arc seconds. Now, again, to put that in perspective, Keep in mind that the night sky is divided into 180 degrees as you look at your half. Every one of those 180 degrees can be divided again into 60 arc minutes. And every one of those arc minutes can be divided again into 60 arc seconds. Well, we're talking about an object that is only 23 arc seconds wide, so it's tiny. It can easily be mistaken for a star at low power, especially when seen through a small telescope. The nebula did not fool William Herschel, though. He discovered it on 1782, in 1782, finding it very bright. He also classified the object, now known as NGC 7009, as a planetary nebula because it was nearly round like a planet and bore magnification, well, like a planet. However, the nebula's hallmark ring-like extensions remained undetected until Lord Rossi, uh, William Parsons, the third Earl of Rossi, scrutinized the nebula with his 72-inch reflector. And in his 1850 paper, Observations on the Nebulae, Rossi described NGC 7009 as having a fairly uniform luminous disk with unsi which probably ind indicate a surrounding nebula, nebulous ring seen edgeways. And uh, Robert Burnham notes that in Celestial Handbook, um, talks about the fact that this is like a miniature Saturn. So Rossi dubbed it as the Saturn Nebula. Arguably, it should be called the Ghost of Saturn Nebula, to parallel Caldwell 59, the Ghost of Jup Jupiter Nebula in Hydra. Well, isn't that fascinating? Okay, so let's see if we can see it. Caldwell 55, the Ghost of Saturn. Let's see if we can see it. Caldwell 55, zooming. There you go. So that's at 100% of our Rasa 11, you're going to have to have your binoculars out, aren't you, to see the rings. But I can see them here live. I hope you can see them. Let's go past 
the optical zoom and let's go until we can see that structure even more. But let's stop right before we start to pixelate, right there, in other words. So we're at 193% of the optical zoom. So quite a ways into the digital zoom, but can you see the Saturn-like uh, rings now? It's fascinating, isn't it? Look at those Saturn-like rings. This is my first time to observe this object. So we're going to add our observation. We're going to say, wow. Uh, we're not going to add that one. We're going to delete that one. We're going to add this one. Now we're going to say, wow, this green tinted planetary nebula really did remind us of Saturn and its ring system. Now, you've probably studied the way these planetary nebulae work. Stu, glad you're here. Uh, you're not late. We just started like impromptu, brother. Uh, so you're not late. But uh, hello back to you, Stu. Glad you're here. You guys have probably studied these uh, planetary nebulae before. What happens is a star, um, maybe a red giant star like Betelgeuse, uh, makes itself puffed up so much and it finally poof, sends out like the shell of a firework on July 4th. You know how those shells can send out light in all directions? Poof, it sends out light in all directions and then the star that's left in the middle is now just a, a lesser mass star and it shrinks down to what might be called a white dwarf, and then it illuminates that white dwarf. It illuminates the back of that essence that it puffed out. And you could think of that puffing out as like gases and, and material, soot. Um, it puffs it out from the star, and then it backlights it like a neon light on a on a restaurant at night at Subway, the, the Subway restaurant that says open, and it's neon light illuminates the window. So this is like being illuminated from the back by that white dwarf. And it makes this puffy thing. You know what it reminds me of? Did you ever attend one of those uh, uh, dinners at a nice hotel on the lawn, and they had these giant lights? And they also do this on the state road construction sites. It looks like a balloon that's, you know, blew, blown up and this white sphere is being illuminated by the, the white light inside of it. Another metaphor would be uh, an old-fashioned Coleman lantern that has the mantle and it's a white gas lantern, you know, and you've pumped it up. If you've ever remember those from the old days and it's got this kind of soot-like white gauze around it. And in the middle is the flame, but the gauze is what's brightly illuminating your campsite. Well, that's what a planetary nebula is. Uh, the material is being lit up by the white dwarf inside of it. What's interesting is these greenish Saturn-like rings are the polarity of that star. You know, stars have a pole just like the north pole of the Earth. And when that material is cast out, it sort of collects like a magnet collects things. And the, the Saturn-like rings that we're seeing here are not rings. They're actually the poles of the star and the material collected at the poles from the mag magnetic pull. And the star is illuminating that material exceptionally well along those poles. So this is fascinating. Like I say, we're at 193%. So at 193% of our Rasa optical zoom, so that is the digital zoom, we could clearly make out the uh, poles of this um, exhausted star. 
now turned firework. That's fine. Caldwell 55. We'll uh, take a picture of this. And uh, let's also take a close up screenshot. Because that's just so tiny that in our picture it's barely going to show up. And we're going to say in our sharp cap captures folder, we're going to say C. Is it 55? Yeah, C55. And it's um, nine minutes. And it's 29, 29 frames on 2022 08. 2022 08 um, 17. Wow, that's just a fascinating. You know, it's almost too bright, isn't it? I bet you if we dial down, let's go ahead now and dial down by going to our next target. You know, it's still too bright. Let's dial this down to maybe two seconds. No, I don't think we're going to be able to see the the white dwarf inside of it. No. The white dwarf is doing such a good job illuminating the shroud that we're not able to pick out the white dwarf. <laughs> Stu says, speaking of Saturn, it is in opposition at the moment, meaning it is the closest closest the Earth, making observations even more amazing. That's true, isn't it? Okay, well, let's finish this off. C55. Add to observing list, call well observed. And then our working list, delete it from the working. And then save. And then let's take a detour and see if Saturn is up. Center on Saturn. 33 degrees above the horizon. Let's slew there. And open up an info pane. So in our screen, if we could zoom in this close, it would look like this. So let's back off now to a more of a rasa, a rasa field of view. <laughs> this red rectangle is showing our rasa field of view. So Saturn's going to look like a planetary nebula <laughs> inside of inside of our frame. But let's go over and see what it looks like. Wow, is that it? It is it. Look at those moons. Wow, look at that. Are we going to be able to detect which one of these are moons and which ones are stars? Let's come back to our uh, Let's pull this over a little bit so we'll be able to see it still. And let's move our panel. Lapetus, is that a, a moon of, is Lapetus a moon of, yeah, it's a moon of Saturn. So the moons begin clear out there with Lapetus. So what we hope we'll find is a moon way out there, and then there should be three moons that are bright, let's zero on it again, so it'll sit still for us. 
So lapsus will be out there. Then you'll see Titan, Rhea, and Enceladus. And on the other side, Tethys and Dion. So probably we should see three on one side and two on the other. Now let's look at the real view. I'm having trouble figuring out where they start. How about you? Let's, let's assume these are the three. Let's assume this is uh, Titan. And let's assume that that is Rhea. And then let's assume this one is Insulatus. And this must be Tethys. But if that's the case, I don't see Dion. Do you think that Tethys is too close? So that's going to probably be Dion. It's amazing, isn't it? We can see all those moons. Now look up here at Telesto. Or is it Calypso? This must be, yeah, this is Calypso here. So again, to, I wonder if, you know, this annotation only works for deep space objects, doesn't it? Yeah. He doesn't have moons annotated. <laughs> Why would we expect Robin to have made up a thing that annotates moons? But maybe someday. So we're going to assume this is Rhea. No. Uh, that was Lepidus. So this is Lepidus. This is Titan. That might actually be Hyperion. Then this is Rhea. This is Enceladus. I said a while ago Telesto, but I don't see Telesto. This has to be Hyperion. This is Tethys or Dion, or maybe both. Maybe there are two moons there. And then these are actually stars. Now, Saturn has a lot of moons. Do you, do you remember how many? I, I think it's like 69 or 80 or some huge number like that. But look how Saturn is being blown out by our exposure. Let's go ahead and take a picture at this exposure so we have a record of all these moons. So let's just do a snapshot of this. Whoops, I need to save the name Saturn, sorry. Um, I wonder if that changed the name. Let's do another snapshot just in case. Yeah. Now let's also do a um, screen capture. And something like what? That? And we'll call it Saturn Libraries. Uh, no. Desktop Sharp Cap Captures. Saturn Moons 2022-08-17. And now let's change our exposure and let's drop it maybe to about 500 milliseconds. See if we can get a little more detail on those rings. Maybe 100 milliseconds. We'll lose the moons, but we're trying to pick up the rings now. 50 milliseconds. Ten milliseconds. Boy. 
our rasa is just not going to be able to. Look at the way the, um, the planet is just boiling in the atmosphere with all the all the atmospheric um, movement. That's that boiling motion that you see there. We, oh, now, there you go, at two milliseconds, we start to see some, some separation between the planet and the ring system. That's two milliseconds. Let's go to one millisecond. Yeah. Now, it becomes very tiny, doesn't it? And again, you get a lot of the atmospheric disturbance. But now you can see at least the separation and what you would need to see Saturn <clears throat> with better resolution is a higher focal length telescope. See, this Rasa is focal length of like 450, 450. And to really do a good job on Saturn, you know, I mean, we could easily use a 3,000 focal length uh, telescope to see this, maybe even 6,000 focal length by using a Barlow with a 3,000 focal length. And we just don't do planetary observing here. We're using deep space uh, with our Rasa. But at least that gives you an idea now of what, sure enough, Stu was saying. Stu says, oh cool, thanks. Uh, it does look like the Saturn Nebula. It is funny, you're right. And Stu says, depending on who you ask, there's either, there are either 82 or hundreds of moons. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, footsteps for Jesus Christ, Bride, Shalom. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight as well. Wow, so it's, uh, we're now nearing our two hour mark, so I know we need to end our live stream, but I think it's fitting that we ended on this uh, special view of Saturn. And thanks, Stu, for alerting us of that. Uh, Let's go back over to our planetarium to our planetarium software and just zoom out. So once again you can kind of see where Saturn is in the night sky. So this is due south. And we're up about, you know, roughly 30-ish degrees. Uh, so that would be like three fifths. If you imagine three fifths up, you could see this. And it's between south and southeast. And you can look tonight. It doesn't have to be a moonless night. You can go out and find it tonight in binoculars. It would look really good. So I hope you'll do that. Well, uh, we made some progress on our um, uh, quest. By the way, let me do a quick entry here. Uh, we picked out at least a half dozen moons in a matter of just a few moments. Had to dial the uh, exposure to one millisecond to see separation of the rings from the planet. Outstanding. Um, we made some progress on our Caldwell list. Let's go here to Live Sky and uh, make sure we've saved, and then let's remove. So we have 56. We have 56 entries yet to go. So almost exactly halfway through the Caldwell list, and we hope you'll come back and join us on another night. Keep in mind we are also making our way uh, through the Herschel list, and uh, that's using this other Stephen James O'Meara guide called the Herschel 400 Observing Guide. So come back and join us for the Herschel List observations as well. We operate from the outskirts of Louisville, Kentucky. If you've enjoyed this tonight, if you like this kind of content, we hope you'll click on that thumbs up button. Uh, that gets this channel and these broadcasts a little bit higher up in the heads up displays of other uh, viewers on YouTube. If you haven't subscribed, when you click the subscribe a link that lets you see when we're on and when you click the bell it actually sends a an alert a notification to your YouTube um, sign on if you stay signed into YouTube more than anything else though this just 
increases this channel's presence among others who might enjoy this kind of astronomy, electronically assisted astronomy. So please do that if you don't mind, and it doesn't cost you anything. Um, we appreciate the fact that you're a part of this, that you've stopped by. Um, we've had a good crowd here all night. Kimberly, thank you for being a part of this. Stu, uh, thanks for going back and watching the start. Uh, Mike, you're right, challenging objects tonight, but you guys hung in there. We appreciate you. God bless you guys, and thanks most of all to God who made all these objects for us to be able to observe tonight. Hope you have a great evening. We're going to say now uh, good night and God bless from uh, Emerald Hills skies. We hope you'll join us again for another broadcast the next time it's clear and we're set up here. God bless and good evening.